button. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Just Talking with Gwenda and Aisha. So I'm here with Aisha uh, Adami Magueda. I love her name because it feels <laughs> like dancing. And I've just realized, thankfully, this week that uh, I've like leave out her last name, and I don't know why. Because like, you know, so I'm gonna just be saying Aisha Adami Magueda because it demands to have a little bit of soca, right? It has a little bit of a movement. I love that. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so that's where we're starting today. So. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. We're talking about recovering from trauma. And again, like any other topic that we've done, uh, we like to give a little bit of background on, you know, what does that look like? How can I be aware of it in my own life? And then, because you have to be aware before you can do anything with it. And so this week we're talking about generational trauma. And, you know, this is Thanksgiving. Sometimes just going to a Thanksgiving dinner, just going to a family dinner can be traumatic, right? Where, you know, uncle so-and-so is weird and aunt so-and-so drinks too much. And, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, families are interesting quirks of life. Uh, my personal belief is that we choose the people in our family before we get here, our spirit, our soul, um, because sometimes that gives us uh, something to work on while we're here. And as you guys know, how this all started is I did that speech about my dad, which was talking about, you know, there's a lot of people that have parents that you can't connect with and you have to cut them off because that's the only way that you can live. But, um, but that is a kind of, our parents are doing what they learned. And if the people, you know, Dr. Leo back in the day was the first guy that ever taught about love. We don't talk about love. We don't talk about how to love people, never mind ourselves. Now we're getting, it's getting more so. So I'm going to give you a really clear example of what generational trauma looks like in a very innocuous situation. I was coaching Mike Ball. Mike Ball was uh, coming from T ball to, to softball. And there was this one girl on my team and she was really kind of lippy. And so we said, okay, let's make her the pitcher because it, it, it'll keep her attention. She's got a big role. Now she was good. She could get it across the plate. And at nine years old, like I was a catcher. So my catcher at nine years old could throw to second because she wanted to impress me. That's what children do, right? If you matter to them, you know, you're the one that sets the bar. Well, I never told this girl that I expected anything less from her. And she was amazing. She was like, she was really, really enjoying it. And then one day she shows up and she's missing the plate. She's missing the catcher. She's not even really there. And I'm like, Hey, what happened? Well, my mom told me that if I got hit by the ball, I could die. Now, this is a very, uh, it is a true fact. If you're, if you get hit by a baseball, you know, uh, it can do damage, but at nine years old, there's nothing that a kid between nine and 12 years old is going to be able to do to you uh, that can do that. And the worst part, and I shared this with the mother who probably thought she was trying to take care of her child. And it's like, you know what? If you taught her to trust her instincts instead of teaching her the fear, because now she's completely useless. She's terrified when she's standing on that mound. And I can't fix that. I can't undo that. I can't unring that bell. And as parents, um, I can only imagine I'm a professional aunt and God knows, you know, you talk to my sister about the coyote conversation where I'm talking to my four-year-old, then four-year-old niece about the cycle of life too much. Um, so this is an example of like, A, you need to be age specific, but the fact that uh, what we say matters, people are those little people around us are sponges and there's developmental years that we really need to be able to look at. So um, that's actually something that, and I was able to share with the mom, it's like, you know, you've just taught your child fear. There's nothing skill related in just not pitching because you might get hurt. I mean, you can, you know, people break their arms walking down the street. You can get killed crossing the street. That's so are you teaching people to be fearful of life or are you teaching them to be, to live life, right? And having, coming from a place of love is, takes a lot of courage, right? So the other thing that I wanted to just bring up at this point is that there is 
something called the ACE test, which allows you to look at your immediate experience. And actually, as Aisha will get into a little bit more of the generational trauma specifically, but um, the ACE experience is adverse childhood experiences. So if you've had a parent in your house, for instance, that uh, drinks or does drugs on a regular basis, uh, because the thing is with that is they might be cool. You know, everybody likes to have a party, but you know, when, if they're drinking because they have to drink every day, then you, you're more than likely not getting your needs met as a, as a growing child. <laughs> and, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's nine questions that are asked or 10 questions, I think. And th this has been put together by like the Gabor Mates and the Stephen Porges and the Bessel van der Kolk's of the world who have studied trauma for years and uh, public health people that notice these trends in children that, you know, um, because if, if we're coming from a home that's, a, that's the war zone, and, and by that, I mean, you're always on edge. You don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know when that other shoe's gonna drop. It may seem like, you know, everybody thinks that trauma like PTSD was only for soldiers. It's not, it's first responders. It's people that when you go through an experience and that experience, your body cannot process that emotional experience at the time. And that's what creates post-traumatic stress. And so, uh, and I'm gonna say injury, not disorder because you can heal. But just like uh, you've witnessed here, even through me is that you need to be aware and you need to be committed to that healing and you need to be able to crawl inside um, because a lot of stuff, we're also coming up to saw when as our, 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 our lovely pagans would call it, which is that's the day of the ancestors, right? That's the, you know, the day of the dead in the, in the Latin cultures. It's, and that's really important. We can love our ancestors, but they also did the best that they could too. And if they were having, outside forces put upon them, they might do things that would have you to have you do certain things because they're passing their fear down to you. So it takes a double whammy because you've got to manage yourself and then you've got to actually go back so that you can actually stop the effect of that generational trauma moving forward. So that's where I'm going to start and I'm going to pass off to Aisha because she's got some wonderful points on this and all yours. Thanks, love. I think you did a great job of talking about uh, inter, what they call intergenerational, transgenerational trauma that goes from, from parent to child and from child then to their own children going forward. I think what's, you know, the whole purpose of talking about trauma is, as, uh, as Gwenda said, is, is to find recovery and to find healing in it. And part of that is to really understand what, where it's coming from and why it has the effect that it has. And one thing about trauma, because trauma is a very loaded kind of word when people talk about it, there's a lot of stuff that comes up. You're talking about fear, you're talking about you know, pro, like injury, you're talking about assault, you could be talking about rape, you could be talking about incest, you could be talking about war, uh, having to being, you know, leaving a war-torn country, coming somewhere else being through uh, what they call um, historic trauma, which affects large groups of people, like the way that uh, the Holocaust affected the Jewish community, the way that slavery affected the Black community, the way that colonization affects Indigenous people even today. So trying to understand how trauma passes down from, from generation to generation is not, not just in response to how people react in situations. So Wendy, you gave some great examples of how when a parent or a grandparent reacts in a certain way that causes a particular reaction in a child. And what they're also learning is something around uh, what they call epigenetics, which is that in, in people who have experienced high levels of post-traumatic stress, that their bodies, the, to respond in particular ways. So some genes are expressed and some genes are repressed. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they pass those traits down to the next generation. So they end up, if they find themselves in a similar situation, they end up responding exactly the same way. So there is 
the kind of psychological element of it, and then there's genetic element of it as well. And the reason to just be aware of that is to is to understand is to is to have compassion for yourself and have compassion for the other people that are dealing with trauma, because this is not something that you know you can say okay well now you need to get over this okay let's move on from this right you it's it is uh, a deeper understanding a more compassionate acceptance of what we as human beings experience individually and what we experience as a whole mm -hmm. and how sometimes things like forgiveness can be very difficult because we want to forgive people but then we look at the, how they behave and we fixate on how they behave and we don't actually think about what is what's happening underneath that what are the reasons for that kind of trauma when you're particularly dealing with the kind of anger and rage that people are talking about now and social just, justice around uh, anti-black racism anti-indigenous racism then it's it's really important to really have the context of that and understand where that's coming from that's not that's people are not making this stuff up they, this is what they've experienced. This is what their ancestors have experienced. And also another thing that, now I'm not an expert in this, but I have read a little bit about uh, intergenerational, transgenerational trauma, is that sometimes what happens is that people, when they get into a similar situation, like people dealing with racism, they their, their whole body responds in the same way that their ancestors responded when they were dealing with that, right? So. When we're dealing with trauma, the first thing to be aware of is that it's real, that people experience it for a myriad of reasons, that uh, there's no blame involved and there's no shame involved mm -hmm. in having trauma. This is an exercise in understanding and having very deep compassion for oneself if you are the one dealing with the trauma or having compassion for other people who are dealing with trauma as well, because that that's what's going to break that cycle is having that understanding, seeing people, recognizing people, understanding them, and giving them the compassion that they need, giving yourself the compassion that you need, even if other people around you don't recognize it and don't understand it. And that's really, you know, I think the, the crux of where the, the traumatic piece lives. And the, the intergenerational stuff is, is very complicated because uh, because there's so much tied into that, so much expectation tied into. As children, we want our parents to respond in a, a certain way. We want our grandparents to respond in a certain way. And if they're shut down, if they're not able to respond that way, we as children internalize that and we blame ourselves for that. And then we carry that blame. And then when we have children, when we're dealing with children, we're not able to open up and be our whole selves. And it isn't until you start unpacking that stuff. And again, with the deepest of understanding and the deepest of compassion, when you start understanding that stuff, then you're able to release, start releasing some of that trauma, right? There are, as Gwenda mentioned, ACE is one method. Uh, people, psychotherapy is another method. Going through different kinds of trauma, um, tra treatment for trauma it are also multiple methods for working through the stuff that we need to work through, but it requires also, as Gwenda said, the commitment and the courage to be able to look at it for what it is and to also let go of all the stories that we've told ourselves about why we're wrong for this happening to us or why our parents are wrong for the way they behaved, why our grandparents are wrong for the way they behaved. It's just recognizing that everyone is doing the best in the situations that they're in. So. I just wanted to add that to our discussion of trauma and recovery from trauma, especially intergenerational trauma. Absolutely. That's and 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 so a couple of things that uh, you know you were talking about. There's also I, I know that years ago I did muscle testing, uh, so that's like a, a form of energy work. But um, like you're carrying a child from the time exactly from the time you're that child is conceived, if something happens while your mother's pregnant, then that affects the child, right? Because those stress hormones are released when, never mind the fact that you're, you know, you're having a baby, that's pretty stressful. The body changes, you know, whatever, uh, whatever else. There's so many different things. I mean, and, and so 
this muscle testing showed that something happened. Now, you know, I don't necessarily buy into this from a, a place that I could go in and solve it or help it because I can't go back to being in the womb. Uh, but it was interesting because it just had me look at the fact that from the time we are actually created, that's when our, that's when the trauma can be passed down. So, you know, you have a fight with your, who knows, maybe people there, who knows? Cause there's so many different kinds of trauma. But the other thing that, um, that you talked about that was really important, cause I'm just um, reading, uh, Dr. Peter Levine's book. And he had a, an interesting take on trauma because he talks about how animals, we are still animals. And uh, there's like a shaking response. You know, your cat, your dog, when they get freaked out and they do a, right? They shake it off. They literally are shaking it off. If, if you've seen an animal that's been through something that's terrified them, then the hair stands up on their body, right? They react to it. And then as soon as it's over, they just like shake it out of their system. And that allows them to get on with life as you know it. Whereas trauma, what trauma does, it's like that, that, that uh, you know, like a, a toilet that just keeps running and running. You know, you got to jiggle the handle a little bit or you got to go in and just, you know, it's, you got to fix the toilet. But before you can fix the toilet, you have to admit that there's something wrong with the toilet. And you might think, oh, it's just the little leaks, but that's also like a drip, drip, drip. So it's so that's the one thing to keep in mind is that basically what happens in post-traumatic stress reactions, response, is because the adrenaline, the cortisol, all those different hormones in your body, they get stuck in the on position. You get stuck in the in the freeze, the fight, flight, or freeze, right? And we all have different ways of reacting and responding. Um, to whatever, because violence is not necessarily good, but trauma is, is something, if it's a car accident, you can't see that coming. That's why they call it an accident, right? Um, even as first responders, you can't, you can go to a gruesome situation and just see things. People in the war, they see things that they should never see. Never mind these kids that are in refugee camps, right? Like zero to seven, zero to 15. And, and you, you're uprooted from your home, bombs are blowing, people are gone. There's, there's a whole bunch, and this is not even getting into what we can actually do here, which is why I was really proud of Canada taking in a lot of refugees in, in many cases. Um, because really the, the second part that I want to get to is the fact that when you are actually talking about that experience, so you're now the plumber that's going up to the handle because you, you, you need to jiggle the handle, but you have to be able to be willing to get in and get your hand wet, right? So when you're holding space, you, you don't have to fix anything. You just have to give people the safety and let them know that they're safe. And then they can get out their story, not necessarily sit in it and re-experience it forever and ever and ever. Because seriously, that's the same as leaving your if you've never said something's wrong with your toilet, it's never going to get fixed. So if you don't actually get in and say, okay, I need to talk to somebody, how that story is retold is so powerful to healing because then if you can get through that and you're in a safe place and you're holding space, then you'll find, like, it's funny just listening to this. There's times where I can actually remember like just doing a shake, or maybe you get into ecstatic dancing, something in which you are fully em em embodied in your body. And that is, that's when we release the stress responses that are stored there from that trauma, right? And that's why the triggers, um, the triggers are just, they're really a big mirror to show you what it is that's actually, um, that's actually affecting you, right? And if you can nail down, oh, okay, this person said this, or um, this this was on the news, and I I was I, I didn't. Now, how did you put that last week? I didn't react. I didn't respond to it in the way that I that I want to, right? Being able to own that moment that takes a lot of self awareness, and it also takes in the middle of the muck um, having somebody that you can trust to talk to, to allow you to, to, to tell that story. The first time you tell a story, 
any kind of trauma, small T, big T, doesn't matter, trauma's trauma. Um, even if it's like, oh, somebody stole my, you, you know, you had a bully at school, you need to tell that story in a safe place so that you can literally shake it off as Taylor Swift says, shake it off, shake it off. And this is not belittling it, but it's, it's, it's true. We can't be just told to suck it up because it's, because if, if you're not even, if you're going to pretend that, oh, there's nothing wrong with the toilet, that's going to drive you crazy. Right. So that's, that's, uh, that's where I, that's where I have with that. Yeah, I think uh, what's what's interesting about what you're talking about in terms of the self-awareness piece is that sometimes when we're stuck, like a, I'm just going to talk about uh, as a survivor of childhood trauma myself, that there were things that I didn't actually realize were causing me to react and go back into trauma mode. So, for example, I used to be a really big fan of these um, crime shows that used to be on TV, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, like... A, not law and order, but SVU, SUV, SVU. No, SVU, yeah, SVU. No, that you know the ones that used to be on A and E, like uh, American Justice and things oh, like that, where they would talk about real life uh, crimes. And it, it wasn't until a few years, and I would, I would just have this kind of, I would realize that I was constantly fearful. I was realizing that I was constantly experiencing anxiety and fear. And it, it wasn't until much later, like a few years later, where I realized that the majority of stories that they talk about on those shows are about women and children getting killed and getting abused. And when I started to realize that, that's when I started to really become aware of where my trauma lives inside of me and what causes me to react to certain situations. When you're with certain people who are speaking to you in a certain way or behaving in a certain way or treating you in a certain way then that trauma response automatically gets triggered again and I say triggered only because you know that's how a lot of people understand it for me I understand it as that's how I react to it or that's how I respond to it so that I can take ownership of choosing a different path right yes. and I think that that's that's really important and also like you said there's some people that are stuck in the on position. So when a situation arises that could be really on a very, on a minor level, mm -hmm. possibly inconvenient, possibly a little bit maybe irritating, but then because they're already in that heightened place of trauma and stress, that they deal with it in a, in a, in a way that appears to be over the top for other people. It's to understand what it actually means to, to live with trauma because recovering from trauma doesn't necessarily mean that you are able to eliminate it entirely. It means also just being aware of what that trauma looks like when it's, when it's activated, what kind of response you have to situations and where, you, where it's a question of, okay, I need to take a breath and I just need to take a step back and I can choose a different way to respond to this situation. And it's really just, to, again, about healing, about bringing the confidence back to ourselves that we are able to deal with this stuff, that we do not have to live in the shadow of the trauma that we've dealt with for our whole lives. We can move beyond it. We can step out of it. And there is a healthier way that we can live that is going to be not just better for us, but better for our relationships, our interactions, and how we see our place in the world and what we can contribute to it. Exactly, and and I know that we hear this, uh, and I love that. I, I just love that. It's all, I, again, I just love. I love this. It's perfect. It always goes exactly where it needs to go. One of the things, especially in the indigenous cultures, as well as uh, you know, is when we talk about our ancestors, your ancestors, your, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have grandparents or even your parents, you know, ask your, ask your mother, ask your father, what was life like for you? We all as children like to hear, oh, tell us what it's like when we're born and tell us the stories of when we're kids and having all those, you know, funny movies and things like that. Um, but it's like, until you, like, I think that especially what happened with my father, once I came to terms with, he's never going to be the guy that's going to be giving me like financial advice, 
well, he, he did actually, but he's not going to be that father knows best kind of guy. So instead I tried to get to know him because the more I could get to know him, I could understand myself, you know? Um, and, and again, we don't usually do that. Like there's a lot of times like where a, a lot of people where it's like, well, have you ever asked your mother if this is what she wanted to be? Did she want to just, did she want to be a mother, especially people of our generation? Did she have hopes and dreams? Was she mm. lucky enough to be with, with a man who supported her like that? Maybe she wanted to be with another woman and she wasn't, and there was too much social pressure for that. So it's like all these kinds of stories. It's really about, it's really about keeping communication going both ways, right? Like, again, it wasn't until my mother was like probably two weeks before she passed away, maybe three. And I had to go and I came in and I said, well, I'm coming in to say good, good night. I'm going home now you know, home, which is 10 minutes away from where she was. And she told me that she snuck out one night and her grandmother was, was, was dying. And she snuck out one night and she came back and she, and she was not able to be there when she died because she had snuck out. And so she's like, so don't sneak out. Now I had never heard that story in my whole life. And it's like, but this is now when I'm hearing it. So it's like, we, we all have these nuggets and it's like, so these times, these Thanksgivings, you know, like COVID's a bit of a bitch. It is, it's a little bit, it's, it's getting on all of our cases. You know what? Let's, you know, take this time. Like, uh, you know, a lot of this is the fear that's coming out in a lot of people too, is you can see people's traumas. They're fearful. They're, they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But the key thing is like, none of us really know. We're getting more and more information as we go day to day. Already we've had two days of, of drop numbers. Why? Because thankfully us in Toronto, people got their acts together and, you know, and, and, and are dealing with things responsibly. But as you said, Aisha, we need to take responsibility. We're all part of this community. And this also means just as a little aside, I'll, I'll post the link for the ACE test, but um, but the other thing is like, there's the strawberry and water festival that's held every year in front of the, um, Toronto, uh, college street police station. And that's for the missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, ceremony. And you can talk to like, you know, the mothers, the, 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 the brothers and sisters, the uncles, the aunts of all these people who have who have disappeared without a trace. And then you have this powerful drumming session where, where you're, you are part of that community, right? So the more that we understand about ourselves and how we're responding, the more aware we are of when our toilet tank is leaking, then the more you're calm in your own body, no matter what happens, right? Because it's easier to shake it off when you're more accustomed to, to, to what's going on in your body uh, at the time of trauma or remembering trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really glad that you brought up the, uh, the murdered and missing Indigenous women because that is an ongoing trauma for the Indigenous community. So, you know, like a lot of, like other people who make that choice, for me, this weekend is about, uh, solidarity with the Indigenous communities and all that they not just have been through but all that they continue to go through and we work in solidarity with them and we work for justice for them in the same way that we work for justice with the Black communities with all the other communities that are dealing with uh, the kind of generational trauma that we're talking about. Yeah well yeah. There, again so we're here we are 30 minutes in it's so easy we could talk for, for hours so uh, I believe like next week we are going to get into, um, I, I know I have it written down, but for some reason I didn't, uh, I don't know it right now, but we will, uh, we will deal, be dealing with another aspect of trauma. And I believe we're getting close to like tips and tricks to how to deal with your, with your system and, and things like that. So Aisha, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And Thank you, darling. Thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. And Thanks, everyone. Thank you, one. And we will see you next week. I hope everybody enjoys their turkey. 
and blessings of, of the intention of the weekend is what I'm going to say, right? Because even if you're in the U.S., I know that there's it's an Indigenous day, hopefully, or some people are looking at it that way. And mm -hmm. uh, and so we'll see you next week. Much love, yes. everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye.